Good morning, students. Our topic for today is about the histology of the respiratory system. The respiratory system allows us to breathe and it brings oxygen into our bodies during inhalation and sends carbon dioxide out during exhalation. Functionally, the respiratory system has two components. The conducting zone which cleanses and humidifies inspired air and provides conduits for air movement to and from the alveoli. It includes nasal cavities, pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and down to the terminal bronchioles. And the other component is the respiratory zone where the actual gas exchange happens. It includes respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs and alveoli. Let us discuss these specific parts one by one. Generally, the conducting zone of the respiratory system is lined by pseudostratified columnar ciliated with goblet cells. In the conducting zone, as the airway goes distally, there is gradual decrease in the height of the lining epithelium and amount of cilia, and there is decrease in number of goblet cells, glands, cartilage, smooth muscle, and elastic fibers. The respiratory portion includes respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveolar sacs and alveoli. These structures are lined by simple squamous epithelium, which is a lining epithelium that is so thin, which allows rapid exchanges of gas like oxygen and carbon dioxide. Let us now discuss the histology of the different parts of the respiratory system. Let us begin with the nasal cavities. There are two regions of the nasal cavity. The olfactory region which contains olfactory epithelium that senses odor and the non-olfactory region which is lined by respiratory epithelium and act as conduits of air. Non-olfactory region consists of vestibule and the nasal cavity. The vestibules are the external dilated part and is the area where the epithelium transitions from stratified squamous epithelium keratinized of the skin to pseudostratified columnar ciliated epithelium of the respiratory system. The nasal cavity is the internal component which lie within the skull and it contains three turbinates, the inferior turbinate, the middle turbinate, and the superior turbinate. The nasal cavity also has a mucous layer that traps impurities and are then removed. The inferior and middle conchae or turbinate are lined with respiratory epithelium, while the superior turbinate or conchae are lined by specialized olfactory epithelium. So, there are two types of epithelia in the nasal cavity. The respiratory area is lined by pseudostratified ciliated with goblet cells, while the olfactory area is lined by olfactory epithelium consisting of bipolar neurons with sustentacular cells and basal cells. The olfactory chemoreceptors for the sense of smell are located in the olfactory epithelium. A specialized region of the mucous membrane covering the superior conchae at the root of the nasal cavity. Histologically, it has no cilia and goblet cells. And the three major cell types of the olfactory epithelium are the olfactory cells, which are sensory bipolar neurons with oval or round nuclei located between the nuclei of the supportive and basal cells. Supportive cells which have more apical, elongated, and oval nuclei, and these are the basal or stem cells which become either supportive or olfactory cells. These are the sustentacular cells with oval nucleus located at the apex. These are the olfactory cells with nucleus located at the mid portion of the epithelium. And these are the basal cells. The olfactory epithelium doesn't have goblet cells that produce mucus. Nevertheless, it has serous olfactory glands or Bowman's glands located below the epithelium at the lamina propria. These glands produce serous fluid which bathes 
olfactory cilia serving as solvent to dissolve the other molecules for detection by the olfactory cells. In this slide, you can see in the picture the abrupt transition between the two epithelia. This is the respiratory epithelium which is lined by pseudostratified columnar epithelium with distinct cilia and many goblet cells. And this is the olfactory epithelium which doesn't contain goblet cell and cilia, but you can find the Bowman's glands at the lamina propria. Another picture showing the respiratory epithelium and the olfactory epithelium. The next organ that we're going to discuss is the larynx. The larynx is a short passage for air between the pharynx and the trachea. It has a rigid wall with hyaline cartilage and elastic cartilage. At the top of the larynx, you can find a structure called epiglottis. It is a flattened structure projecting from the upper rim of the larynx and serves to prevent swallowed food from entering the airway. This is the epiglottis as shown in the picture on the left, which opens when you breathe and no food is passing. And this is the epiglottis as shown in the picture on the right, which closes when you swallow food so that food passes through the esophagus instead of accidentally entering the airway, which is quite dangerous. The two surfaces of epiglottis are the lingual surface with the surface facing the tongue, that is why it is called lingual surface, and the laryngeal surface which faces the larynx. Central to the two surfaces is an elastic cartilage which serves as the framework of the epiglottis. The lingual surface is lined by stratified squamous epithelium non-keratinized. It needs this kind of lining epithelium since it is in constant contact with swallowed food. On the other hand, the laryngeal surface is lined by pseudo-stratified columnar ciliated with goblet cell. Take note that you may find taste buds here. The larynx has false vocal fold, true vocal fold, and a ventricle. The false vocal fold is continuous with the mucosa of the posterior surface of epiglottis. It is lined by pseudo-stratified columnar ciliated with goblet cells. Underneath the lining epithelium are mixed seromucous glands. The true vocal fold is lined by stratified squamous non-keratinized. Contrary to the false vocal fold, you cannot find glands underneath the lining epithelium and instead you can find vocalis muscle which is a skeletal muscle type. Also, you can find cricoid cartilage, which is a hyaline type of cartilage. This is found at the lowermost portion of the larynx. The ventricle is a deep indentation and recess that separates the false from true vocal fold. Lamina propria blends with the perichondrium of the hyaline thyroid cartilage. This is the false vocal folds, and this is the true vocal folds. Take a look at this video. Every time you speak, the true vocal folds touch each other. That is why it is lined by stratified squamous epithelium since there is constant friction. The next structure that we are going to discuss is the trachea. The trachea is a 10 to 12 centimeters long. Its mucosa is lined by pseudo-stratified columnar ciliated with goblet cells. The trachea is equipped with C-shaped hyaline cartilage. This is the letter C-shaped cartilage and posteriorly or the part that is in contact with the esophagus is devoid of cartilage. That posterior part devoid of cartilage is primarily made up of trachealis muscle, a smooth muscle which relaxes during swallowing. Imagine when you swallow food, the trachealis muscle relaxes to facilitate the passage of food by allowing the esophagus to bulge into the lumen of the trachea, with the elastic layer preventing excessive distension of the lumen. This is a cut section of esophagus. This is the lining epithelium. This is the C-shaped cartilage with the defect at the posterior area. The posterior area is where you can find the trachealis muscle. 
The next structures that we are going to discuss are the bronchus and bronchioles. This is the trachea which branches into right primary bronchus and left primary bronchus and you can see it in the picture in green color. The right primary bronchus divides into three secondary bronchi and the left primary bronchus divides into two secondary bronchi. You can see it in the picture in blue color. And on the right, there are 10 tertiary bronchi. And on the left, there are 9 tertiary bronchi, as seen in the picture in yellow color. And the smaller bronchi and bronchioles, as seen in the picture in red color. The bronchus is lined by pseudostratified columnar ciliated with goblet cells. You can see smooth muscles encircling the entire circumference of the bronchus, and underneath are irregular hyaline cartilages or islands of hyaline cartilages, and these cartilages decrease in size and number as the bronchi continue to divide and going distally. And at about 1 mm diameter, there is already disappearance of cartilage. The airway is already called bronchule. This is a bronchus. Why it's called a bronchus? You can see the lining epithelium, which is pseudostratified columnar ciliated with goblet cells. These are the smooth muscles, and of course, you can see the islands of hyaline cartilages. The next structure is the bronchule. The larger bronchules are lined by pseudostratified columnar ciliated with goblet cells, while the smaller bronchules are lined by simple cuboidal ciliated epithelium. The last part of the conducting portion of the respiratory system is the terminal bronchiole which is lined by simple columnar to simple cuboidal epithelium. It is encircled by smooth muscle and you cannot see cartilages which makes the mucosal folds more prominent. This is a bronchiole. You can appreciate the mucosal folds which are prominent and smooth muscles encircling the entire lumen and you cannot see cartilages at all. This slide shows to you the trachea with C-shaped cartilage, bronchus with islands of cartilages, and bronchule which doesn't have cartilage but with prominent mucosal folds. The terminal bronchioles has club cells or bronchiolar exocrine cells which is histologically described as non ciliated dome-shaped apical ends containing secretory granules. Few of its functions include secretion of surfactant, detoxification, and antimicrobial property. So in the picture on the right, these are the club cells since they are non ciliated and with dome-shaped apical ends. This is another picture of club cells, non ciliated dome-shaped apical ends, and appreciate the secretory granules. Some of the granules are pointed by red arrows. And the last structures that we will discuss are structures composing the respiratory portion, namely respiratory bronchiole, alveolar duct, and alveolar sac and alveoli. The respiratory portion is called respiratory portion because it is the site of gas exchange. The respiratory bronchiole is the first part of the respiratory portion. It is the transition zone between air conduction and gaseous exchange or respiration. It is lined by simple cuboidal epithelium, ciliated in the proximal portion, non-ciliated in the distal portion. Appreciate also the presence of smooth muscle. Distal ends of respiratory bronchioles branch into tubes called alveolar ducts that are consequently open to numerous alveoli. And lastly, again, the alveoli, which are the terminal end of alveolar ducts described as sac-like evaginations. This slide shows to you the terminal bronchiole, which branches to become respiratory bronchioles, and distally becomes alveolar duct, which eventually open to alveolar sac and the alveolus. An alveolus has various cells. Let's identify three major types of cells in the alveolus. 
First is type 1 pneumocytes which make up 95% of the alveolar lining. Type 1 pneumocytes are simple squamous epithelium which make the alveolar side of the blood air barrier. This is so thin that it facilitates rapid gas exchange. Another cell type are type 2 pneumocytes which make up 5% of the alveolar lining. They are cuboidal cells that bulge into the airspace interspersed among the type 1 pneumocytes. Primarily, type 2 pneumocytes synthesize surfactants, a substance that prevents alveolar collapse during respiration. And another cell, the alveolar macrophages or dust cells, which are resident macrophages that may contain several carbon or dust particles in the cytoplasm. This is type 1 pneumocyte, which is simple squamous. This is type 2 pneumocyte, which is simple cuboidal. And these are alveolar macrophages with engulfed carbon particles. The picture on the left shows macrophages with engulfed hemosiderin. These macrophages are called heart failure cells because these are found in congestive heart failure. The picture on the right shows macrophages with engulfed carbon particles. Most likely, this patient is living in polluted area. There are also pathways of collateral ventilation which ensure that distal lung units are ventilated despite the obstruction of a proximal airway. These pathways are channels of Martin which is a communication between two adjacent bronchioles. Channels of Lambert, which is a communication between non-respiratory bronchial and adjacent alveolus. And pores of con, which is a communication between two adjacent alveoli through perforations in their walls. This picture shows to you that in the event that there is obstruction, the pathways of collateral ventilation make sure that the distal lung units are still being ventilated. And now, let's try to identify some structures. Identify the epithelium of the nasal cavity. If your answer is olfactory epithelium for A and respiratory epithelium for B, then you got it right. How about this? Identify the surface of epiglottis. If your answer is lingual surface for A, since it is lined by stratified squamous epithelium non-keratinized, and laryngeal surface for B, since it is lined by pseudo-stratified columnar ciliated with goblet cell, then you got it right. How about this? Identify the tissue. If your answer is bronchial for A, trachea for B, and bronchus for C, then you are right. And how about this? Identify the cells. If your answer is type 2 pneumocyte for A, alveolar macrophage for B, and type 1 pneumocyte for C, then you got it right. And that's the end of our lecture.